Hello and welcome to Money Life. This is Sucheta Dilal. What are we talking about this week? It's about how our regulators are actually looking pretty good at the moment, but lots of questions, especially about the way the Securities and Exchange Board of India is striving hard to do things, but repeating the same mistakes of the past. Before we come to that, let's look at the good news. Okay, so Indian regulators are actually looking very good after the collapse of the crypto exchange FTX following a gigantic fraud and a complete meltdown all around the world. India was largely untouched by it, especially because of the stand taken by Shaktikanta Das, governor of the Reserve Bank of India. Even as the finance ministry, Mandarin seemed to be dithering about whether or not to legalize crypto during the budget. And believe me, there was intense pressure from the industry to say, say something that will make cryptocurrencies look legal. Mr. Das stood firm. And I think that has saved and protected so many investors from being hit at this global collapse of cryptocurrency. People who said Bitcoin would never collapse, even that has collapsed. And in fact, some people are writing off the future of the industry. We don't know whether that's going to happen, but let's talk a bit about what FTX did. So the FTX founder, Sam Bankman Fried, sent out an email bombshell that said, I'm sorry, I effed up. Now, FTX was a giant Ponzi scheme. And in retrospect, this highly publicized 29-year-old wonderkind founder seems to be really brilliant at projecting himself. He managed to get the best people in the world producing videos, which talked about how he's a genius, an altruistic genius who's just giving away all the wealth that he's earned to people who deserve it, causes who deserve it. So people should join his bandwagon and there's only money to be made. To many of us in India, the FTX founders mere culpa, in fact, harks back to remember Ramalinga Raju and his letter bomb of 2009. I remember that morning when all hell broke loose. People couldn't believe that this was actually happening. This very, very award-winning company with the glittering boards had the chairman write a letter to the directors saying that I've cooked the books for years and the cash on the balance sheet just does not exist. The entire IT world was shaken up. Most of the better companies have revived, but FTX and crypto seems like a much larger version of exactly this. Now, the fact is that regulators struggle. Regulators in India, regulators all over the world struggle to stay ahead of ingenious scamsters. We've been following a variety of scams for 30 odd years, and believe me, only a big scam can only be done by a really, really smart, ingenious scamster. And they're constantly finding new ways to exploit situations, technologies, loopholes. And most of the smart guys are through with their scam before the regulator wakes up and starts fixing the rules. Now, one more example just last week was the utter simplicity with which Eli Lilly's stock just collapsed. Sheer genius. It took advantage of what Twitter did. Twitter has a new owner in Elon Musk who decided that he's going to sell what is called the blue tick or blue check. He named it Twitter Blue and said, pay a monthly subscription of $8 and without bothering with verification, all of us will get a blue tick. This was rolled out. So guess who jumped up? An imposter took advantage of this, created an account in the name of Eli Lilly, paid the $8 subscription, got a blue tick. Eli Lilly is a well-known US pharmaceutical company. He got a handle which said Eli Lilly and Co. So impersonating because Eli Lilly's handle is Lilypad. Who's going to know? Most of us don't know. We don't take a look at the handles. We look at the name tag that goes along with it, which was Eli Lilly Pharmaceuticals. He then tweeted one single sentence, which is showing you here on 10th November. It said, we are excited to announce insulin is free now. So if insulin, which is the best-selling product of this company, is going to be free. Where's revenue going to come from? So all hell broke loose at what they thought was an official announcement from the company. The stock quickly crashed. It lost US $15 billion in market capitalization. And there was such a noise that Twitter was forced to halt this hasty rollout of Twitter Blue. 
It canceled the imposter's verification. It set its tweets at private. It's already collected $8 from him. But for investors, the damage was done. And for most of them, it is not reversible. Money is gone. As far as this kind of scam is concerned, one would say the window of opportunity is closed. It's unlikely that the same scam can be repeated in the same manner, with the same trick. But social media lends itself to many scams. In fact, I have myself been a victim of this kind of manipulation in June 2021. Some of you may remember what happened. I had put out a tweet about how the stocks of a particular group were being ramped up and that it was difficult to get any evidence about how it was being done. Now, that tweet went out on Friday and it was deliberately misused. It was, in my mind, engineered and made to go viral by vested interests in what we didn't know then, but was obviously a market operation to push down prices. From Friday evening, around the time I tweeted, till Monday morning, two mainstream business media publications helped to create the panic. One did nonstop coverage on the group and how its prices were inflated. And another paper on Monday morning had a lead story, a misleading lead story about some regulatory action against the group. All this engineered to create a huge fall in share prices when the market opened. In fact, in a matter of minutes, the stock prices of the group had crashed. Obviously, somebody had shot that. They recovered a little later. But within minutes, it's almost as though people had their memes ready, but there were memes going out all over the place that a single tweet that I'd put out on Friday evening had caused stock prices to crash. Now, for the record, no other tweet of mine has on far more serious issues has got this kind of response. It was engineered. The regulator did not even bother to ask even informally what happened. Perhaps they were aware that this kind of operation can only be done by a very, very powerful entity with deep pockets and connections all through the industry. And in fact, that was clear later because a lot of people who I would not expect were talking about this tweet well before the market opened on Monday. And the audacity of this operation to surreptitiously exploit an individual's credibility shows you how social media can be misused and manipulated. It's just one more example. This can possibly happen again with somebody else because I don't think the regulators have even fixed it. In any case, Indian regulators are absolutely against inimical to market intelligence. They do not want to talk to people on the floor of exchanges or in front of screens, you would say. They only talk to market intermediaries who are all interdependent, speak the same language, or people who provide services. So legal firms, proxy advisors, accounting firms, consultancy firms, all these who are employed by market infrastructure institutions and large brokerage firms and mutual funds are the ones that the regulator speaks to. It is not interested in any independent outside views because independent views by their very nature may not be palatable to people who want to only hear good things. So just ignore them or say that they're exaggerated. That means the flow of information to the regulator is so minimal and most often they don't ever get the truth until it's too late. They disbelieve things until there is a panic or there is a noise. These days it's easy because it's on social media. The regulator invariably reacts just too late. This time, I think things are different. The new chairperson, Madhvi Puri Butch, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Board of India, is a lady in a hurry. She's in her second stint. Mind you, she was a whole time member, finished a term, had an opportunity to watch what was going on, and she seems to be in a hurry to fix a lot of things. She's been setting up a whole bunch of committees, and now those discussion papers and recommendations and regulations are coming out almost at the rate of one a day. It's just adding to a lot of friction. And I believe that mere good intentions do not lead to better regulation. In fact, it just leads to more bureaucracy and more fiction. This can really clear 
from the big co-location scam that happened at the National Stock Exchange. This was considered an extremely professionally run, honest, pristine institution with a near monopoly on the Indian markets, the third largest exchange in the world. And look at the amount of dirt that is coming on. We broke the Colo scam in 2015, but a lot of what is coming out, the mismanagement, the manner of appointments and tapping of phones and things that have happened, were absolutely unknown and have been spilling out in the public domain. So clearly some of SEBI's efforts, whatever the name of the committee, have as their core, the intention to fix this. SEBI issued three major reports or discussion papers last week. One was on strengthening governance of market infrastructure institutions. This is an important one. The second was a review of disclosure requirements of material events by listed entities. Third was a framework to protect investors of companies who are going through a bankruptcy or insolvency process. SEBI also streamlined knobs for unpaid shares, tweaked the rules for appointments and removal of independent directors, and announced a framework to facilitate online bond platform providers. Now, a lot of this is good work. Some of this long overdue. The one on unpaid shares, for instance, concern for shareholders, going through bankruptcy. These are neglected issues. One wonders why they were neglected, but this was much needed. But let's come to the important one, which is the discussion paper on market infrastructure institutions. Now, or even the disclosures that have to be made by entities. Now, I'm very clear, but both of these have been set up because of certain events. In case of market infrastructure institutions, I would think two things would warrant such a committee, whatever Sebi may say. One is the NSC debacle and whatever was happening there, it really caught the regulator napping. But as usual, the buck never stops at SEBI. So no one's questioning the regulator and asking them, what were you doing? Didn't you know what was going on at an exchange that had over 90% of trading volumes in the country? But be that as it may, here's a committee. The committee is supposed to look at fixing shocking lack of governance and wrongdoing. So what does it do? Now, first of all, if SEBI wanted a really different outcome, it would need to discuss the issue frankly. The committee members would have to talk about what happened very, very frankly. Now you look at the composition of the committee and you don't know, you know why it won't happen. The committee was exactly like all SEBI committees have been for the last 25 years or more. Now, there's a quote that is misattributed to Albert Einstein, which says, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Did SEBI set up a different type of committee? No, same type of committee. What does this mean? Heads of stock exchanges are over there. The national stock exchanges, MD and CEO is on the committee. The exchange, heads of other exchanges are on the committee. And then the usual stakeholders who are either regulated entities, subservient to SEBI or employed by the big market infrastructure institution. So accountants, lawyers, proxy advisors all depend on business very for the very same market infrastructure institutions at company. This group, without discussing the big elephant in the room, is going to tell you how to fix things. The committee is headed by a full-time member who told a WhatsApp group, believe it or not, that all talk about regulatory capture by the NSC is unadulterated nonsense. Regulatory capture, remember, is the name of our book, which talks about all the good, bad, and ugly of the NSC. What happened? What went wrong? Naturally, the regulators don't like it. Like I said, they were caught napping. Same regulators order in the Colo scam declared without evidence that logging in first to high frequency servers did not give brokers an advantage. This, in fact, weakened SEBI's case and has been used by NSC in its appeals against SEBI orders. And if that is your belief, why on earth was this manipulation happening? Why log in first at all? Why were brokers spending so much of energy? But I'm not going to go into this. This is the person who's going to talk about better governance, head the committee, and those are the stakeholders. We do the same thing, expect different results, not going to happen. Vikram Lima is there on the committee. People in India are polite. No one's going to talk. Nobody even wants to talk about 30 broker defaults during his tenure. I did. I made a presentation. It's been completely ignored. Doesn't find any mention in the uh, committee's recommendations. 
I don't even know why they wasted my time. Now, the committee did not think it was scandalous, apparently. But there is some action over there by the NSC. I'll come to that later. What are the key recommendations? So they say you have 50%. So when demutualization of exchanges happened more than a decade or two ago, they said they threw out brokers, first of all, from the boards of exchanges and got public interest directors, PIDs, they call them. 50% were public interest directors. Committee wants them increased to two thirds. Will this make a difference? Because take a look as an exercise of all NSC directors over the last 20 years. They are the biggest names in Indian, in the Indian financial world. Luminaries, the top lawyers, Supreme Court judges, N number of finance secretaries, people who have headed commissions, the best known chartered accountants who have been sitting on the boards of regulatory bodies. They didn't find anything wrong. They didn't see NSC sliding. They were happy to be benign, benign collect hefty sitting fees, running into crores, and delegate all parts to the managing director. Not one of them has been questioned. So is the committee talking about responsibility and questioning them when things go wrong? No, we don't come to that. What it says instead, nice mix of skill sets, but I've mentioned the kind of people there were, these skill sets, technology, finance, accounts, law, risk management, capital market administration, those were the boards of directors. In fact, I, any student of management or finance should take a look at it and say, these are the directors, how is your recommendation different? NEC boards invariably did nothing, no matter how decorated people were, no matter that they were chairman of stakeholder companies in the NSC, they were happy to delegate powers. Now, won't they still be selected in the same manner because of who they are, the posts that they held, because they are friends of finance ministry bureaucrats, because they are friends of top SEBI officials or the exchange press? No mention in the report about it. What kind of selection? It only talks about a mix. And when things finally go wrong, there's no talk about what happens. Instead, it has all these motherhood statements like public interest directors should independently meet top officials, key management personnel, as they call it, without the chairman and MD being there. Do people speak out? Walls have years, things go back. It is not going to happen because the KMPs are also selected by the CEO and MD, and they're going to be loyalists to go there. They're then asked to prepare a report, which is going to be sent to the regulator. I know from experience that simple reaction of boards is not to start doing any work because they paid for it, but to ask the exchange to appoint another consultant. So there will be another consultant, another accounting firm, which will prepare this report. That report will be discussed over one board meeting and sent out to the regulator. So I keep asking this question. If you want things to be different, what happens if there is still a problem? If there's another rogue MD, Will the board be held accountable? Will SEBI be held accountable? Not at all. In fact, have they even fixed what they found? So I keep saying if key management personnel are expected to speak out, then let's take an SEC example. One key person who's been there over 25 years has now retired was one J. Ravi Shankar, who's in charge of compliance, law, company secretary, was rewarded all the time for his silence and has never been punished or indicted in any of the seven, eight uh, investigations conducted by SEBI and n number of uh, reports and indictments that have happened after. Not a word. Why is it going to be different? If you do the same thing, if you don't address the elephant in the room, I don't know, but a big fat report has come out. So like I said, the report is high on concepts like you know, code of conduct, guiding principles, compliance, risk management, but no discussion on what made the NSC turn from a super efficient organization into a monster that was crushing competition, was getting away with whatever it wanted to do, making appointments without asking SEBI. Absolutely no discussion. Now let's come to the broker default issues that anyone who's been watching this blog knows that we feel very strongly about 30 broker defaults in one five-year tenure. That is not addressed by this committee, but NSC sets up a committee, which is vague, 
which is not you know limiting it to these 30 to say what happened find out and were those investors treated fairly or not instead there's a vague mandate to review the rules suggest remedies detect misuse of investor funds leading to broker defaults that is very very clear if you look at all the articles that we have written on the 30 defaults that analysis is out there in the public domain nsc's negligence the fact that nsc was only focused on higher and higher turnover and turnover fees is also very evident from n number of reports congratulatory messages that have been sent out who am i talking about Brokers like Carvi, Anugra, Modex, BMA Wealth, hundreds of crores have been lost. These turned out to be Ponzi schemes. NSC did nothing until they defaulted. In fact, Carvi was given over a year even after it defaulted. Then they turn around and say, investors are greedy. They should have been more vigilant. They put their money blindly. But what about the exchange? Did nothing. Now, who's on this committee? At least two of them. I don't have all the names yet but at least two of them are former SEBI officials who actively protected the NSC during their stint as the regulators. We do the same thing and expect different results and pretend to be doing something, it's not going to work. Since SEBI wants a public discussion, here's my feedback. I'm not going to write it to them. If they want, they can look at this blog and look at my columns. And the bottom line that I'm going to reiterate is just good intention is not going to lead to good outcomes. SEBI needs to go to the root of the matter, get the right people on board in order to get different results. Otherwise, it's going to be committee after committee, week after week, more red tape, more bureaucracy, more compliance, so that every market intermediary will be focused more on doing that than doing its main job, which also can lead to disastrous results. If you agree, all of you can respond to this discussion paper. So get there, write, it's all online. There is an email ID at the end of the report. Make your views known because these are going to be considered, ought to be considered, or we can criticize them when they're not considered. So make the effort. If you like what I said, share this blog so that more people are enthused to respond. And of course, please subscribe and please share the subscription. Thank you.